Hello and welcome to a special GC360 panel discussion on the presidential election as the vote count proceeds in key states across the country, including Georgia. Joining me today are Jahan El-Jabahi, an assistant professor of business law at Georgia College, and Dr. Harold Mock. Dr. Mock is an assistant professor of history and director of the leadership programs at Georgia College. Also with us today is Ariel LeBeau, who has been a Georgia College undergraduate and is president of the college chapter of Young Americans for Liberty. Thank you all so much for coming and talking with me today. Great to be here. Let's get right to our discussion. So as of right now, Biden is closing in on the 270 electoral votes needed to win the presidency. He is leading in Arizona and Nevada. And if he secures those states, he will get to 270. If he wins Pennsylvania, he will win regardless of what happens in Arizona and Nevada. And if he wins Georgia and just one other state, he will win. Trump has a much narrower path. So he has to win almost all of the five states that are still in question, which are North Carolina, where he's ahead and generally expected to win. Georgia, where his lead has been dwindling as counting votes in heavily Democratic counties like Fulton continues. Arizona, where Biden looks like he's sufficiently ahead to win the state, but also some late votes coming in are favoring Trump and Nevada. So Professor al what do you think about the results so far? Um, one thing that I've been really impressed by are all the election officials in the states, um, how they've really tried to be really as transparent and professional as possible and respectful of all the volunteers and the poll workers who've been working these polls. Uh, they are adhering to their state laws. Uh, they appear to be processing the ballots in a really um, professional way. And so the results are, uh, I think the media has prepared us in a lot of ways. And these officials have also prepared us to realize that it's going to take some time. And so for those of us who received that message and it sunk in, this is not unsurprising. Um, and um, for anyone who's trying to say that this is unusual is spinning a tail um, for their own purposes. Absolutely. Dr. Mock, have these numbers and results surprised you so far? I think uh, the numbers and results have surprised everybody. Um, <clears throat> in particular, some of the uh, big surprises, of course, is right here in Georgia, um, where we certainly um, knew that uh, the, the um, gap between Trump and Biden would be maybe smaller than it was between Clinton and Trump four years ago, but I don't know that we ever considered that it would be as razor thin as it is, nor that Georgia would be um, in the national spotlight for as long as it has, um, because Georgia has been so reliably Republican um, for, for such a long time. Absolutely. Ariel, how do you feel about how close this race has been? That's been the most surprising thing to me about this election because, I mean, Georgia has not gone for a Democrat in a presidential election since 1992. So to see it, Georgia become an actual battleground state in this election is very interesting. And I'd like to see the future of Georgia as a potential battleground state in the future. Professor al do you think that that's possible? Do you think that maybe it's just this election that's making it so neck and neck? Or do you think Georgia might potentially be a swing state? I think Georgia is a swing state now and will be in the future. I was just looking at the numbers and looking at the math and the margin between Republican Democrat for the president is 12,765 votes at this moment. Um, and if you looking at the Libertarian, it's 60,678. It uh, just shows you how many votes out there um, and how close this thing is. And so I think Georgia's definitely moved into a solid swing state category. And do you think that that's because we have more people voting in Atlanta or in counties like Fulton? Yeah, I think it's the, the growing metro areas of the state. Yeah, absolutely. So Dr. Mock, Professor al he mentioned how um, it is taking a little bit longer than some say it would usually take. Um, however, there have been a lot of mail-in ballots, absentee ballots. How long do you think it will be until we get the results? Um, well, that certainly remains to be seen. Um, I, um, my, my assumption will be that um, we will probably know something uh, by the end of the day tomorrow, by Friday, um, 
I think it's a question of how quickly these votes are uh, processed and counted in Nevada, which uh, in Nevada, which has been a little bit slower than uh, than we might have expected. Um, in Georgia, where things have been progressing a little bit faster than we might have expected, or the uh, I think perhaps the other wild card is in Pennsylvania. Um, but there has been um, there's been much more litigation um, in Pennsylvania that may um, that may slow down uh, the counting and processing of the votes. Um, to take us back just a moment um, <clears throat> to something that uh, Professor El Jabagi said, the um, the elections in the United States, in a, in a way, we've been sort of spoiled for the past couple of year, past couple of decades, in which we often knew the winner very quickly on election night. Um, but there have been some uh, significant uh, intervening factors. Um, one is that our elections have got, seem to have gotten a little bit closer. Another is that we are uh, relying, certainly in Georgia, on paper ballots, which are um, going to be a little bit uh, slower to process, um, but, we chose, but we chose that as a state. Um, but for most of American history, until uh, well into the 80s, um, we often didn't know the winner of the presidential election uh, for much of American history for days, weeks, and months. It's why uh, the lame duck period used to be uh, through March, and now it is through January. Um, so um, any, any characterization of this as anomalous or odd is uh, really far out of step with uh, the long sweep of American history. Absolutely, and it does take time to count things. And I think it's more important for us to take a little longer and do everything accurately than to try and just like shift everything through super quickly and get you the results in one night. You did talk about how there have been some, um, some intervening with the counting of the votes. So, you know, these past few days, officials have been working tirelessly on counting votes, um, but Trump has made attempts to intervene. He has casted doubt on counting and has even stopped the counting in various places. Ariel, how do you feel about this? I'm honestly not too surprised to see it. Um, in general, most absentee ballots, maybe not most absentee ballots, but the blue shift occurs as more absentee ballots are counted, they tend to be uh, for Democratic candidates. So it does make me wonder whether the Trump campaign's thought process here is that the more absentee ballots are counted, the more of them will be for Biden, which would, would obviously be bad for the Trump campaign. It's kind of an uncharitable assumption, and I don't want to assume that that is their intention, but it might make sense. And I hope that that's not what they're thinking. Professor al -Jabahi, do you think there is any truth to back up Trump's immense doubt on the counting of the votes? Like Ariel, I don't think it's surprising that this was the tactic. When I was in law school and I took civil procedure, the teacher said that if the facts in a case are not on your side, then maybe you can win on procedure. And so in this particular case, it looks like a tactic of the president who is a fighter when the facts, maybe the votes are not on the side, then maybe he can attack the procedure as a way to get it a win. And so it's just another tactic at trying to either slow down or generate uh, doubt, um, maybe sow some seeds. Uh, and I don't think that there are any grounds for any of the complaints that have made so far. There have been allegations that um, poll watchers have not been uh, allowed closely enough to observe. And so in some cases, they've been allowed within six feet. Um, there have been allegations of um, ballots that were received late. For instance, in Georgia, they filed suit saying that ballots that were received past seven o'clock were included in the other ones, which was uh, the judge uh, tossed it out saying that there was no evidence to support that. It seems from state to state where these cases have been filed that there have not been any factual grounds to support any of these claims. Thank you. Dr. Mock, do you think, what do you think the likelihood is that Trump will demand a recount? Um, I mean, it, it's already happened. Uh, Donald Trump uh, has demanded a recount in Wisconsin, um, but it's important to remember, we didn't have one election. We had thousands of elections. Um, individual, uh, you know, states and, and uh, municipalities manage the elections. Um, so, uh, you know, um, Two nights ago, Donald Trump uh, 
said um, really without um, a lot of uh, basis, and I imagine without having consulted with uh, an attorney, um, that he wants this to, he wants the Supreme Court to intervene. Um, that's not necessarily how uh, the law works in this country. The uh, Supreme Court doesn't have uh, original jurisdiction in this case, um, it, which is why I think we've seen the, uh, which is why I think we've seen um, the Trump campaign throw various arguments at the wall and see which ones stick. So in some states, um, the camp, the Trump uh, campaign is arguing that all voting must, uh, all all vote counting must stop. In other jurisdictions, they're saying um, that the voting must can, uh, the counting must continue, and um, they're making diametrically opposed arguments depending on um, where they perceive their individual strengths and weaknesses. The um, the uh, but the likelihood of uh, of requesting a recount that has already happened. It's simply a question of um, I think the president's and the campaign's appetite um, for extending this um, extending this for a long time. In Wisconsin, Governor Scott Walker, uh, a, a, a deeply avowed Republican even said a recount is not going to change a gap of, of 25 to 35,000 votes um, that uh, the president trails Joe Biden with in that, in that state. Yes. To Dr. Mock's point, sorry, just for a second, um, in regards to the, you know, throwing whatever sticks, I heard a, a montage, an audio montage of Trump supporters in Pennsylvania chanting, stop the vote, stop the vote, and Trump supporters in Nevada saying, count every vote, count every vote. So just, it's, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, and it absolutely does vary as both of you mentioned, you know, wherever he's ahead, it's like, oh, that's probably accurate. And wherever he's not, it's like, oh, there's, there's gotta be something wrong there. Ariel, what do you think the likelihood that, I, he's already done it in Wisconsin, what do you think the likelihood um, that Trump demands recounts in more states that he's losing in is? It's probably very likely, given that he's already done it in Wisconsin. I don't see why he would hesitate to do it in other states as well. And Dr. Mock, how long do you think if he did end up demanding recounts in more states and got approved for them, how long do you think that process could take? Oh, goodness. Well, I'm, I'm old enough uh, to remember the election of 2000 um, when we didn't know the answer to recounts for weeks and weeks. We were well into December um, and uh, the, the campaigns were still uh, disputing recounts uh, in Florida, uh, in the uh, uh, courts in Florida and then at the U.S. Supreme Court. And I believe it was the, um, I want to say it was December 18th before we knew the outcome of that election that it happened in the, uh, the first, uh, first week of November, the uh, obviously uh, the, the Bush-Gore um, election. Um, but just as we have thousands of elections on election day, each state has its own um, uh, procedures for petitioning a recount. So in the case of Wisconsin, for instance, um, any any uh, party can request a recount, but they have to pay for it. Um, that was the case in the 2016 election um, in which uh, Jill Stein, representing the Green Party, uh, wanted there to be a recount. Um, but um, that will be, um, but that's simply the case in Wisconsin. In other jurisdictions, um, there's an automatic recount if the vote was, is within a certain margin, half of a percentage point or a single percentage point. Um, so it's simply a, a question of, I would say we probably have to identify these, these, uh, these swing states um, and then um, maybe see what the appetite is of the campaigns for, for seeking those uh, seeking those recounts. Absolutely, and Professor Al Jabahi, you mentioned earlier how Georgia really has become a swing state. What do you think the likelihood that Georgia will have a recount in this election is? It's getting so slim, so, uh, so I, I think it's pretty likely. Yeah, I mean, as Dr. Mock mentioned, it's on the person who requests the recount to fund it, and so. Whether or not they're willing to stomach funding a recount is another question. Um, but if they have the funds, then I think it's pretty likely. Right. Ariel, do you think there is any possibility that Biden will request a recount in any states? 
I don't know. It's not impossible, mm -hmm. but I think, at least if I were Biden, given that the, the tactics that the Trump campaign is currently using, um, re requesting recounts and demanding that votes not be counted anymore in some states while demanding that votes continue to be counted in other states, definitely makes it look like his campaign wants to kind of play fast and loose with the rules of elections so that they get the result they want. And if I were Biden, I would kind of steer away from that as much as possible just to present myself as, you know, the complete opposite and therefore probably not ask for a recount. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring that up. Do you think that the way he is like singling out some states and saying the complete opposite for different states, do you think that's going to backfire on him? I don't know. Honestly, I'm just interested to see how all of this will play out. Um, we knew it was going to take a long time for all of the votes to be counted. And we knew that we weren't going to know who the president for the next four years will be on election night. So at this point, it's basically a waiting game. Yeah. So my next question is, we all know right now Biden is slightly ahead. So what do we think will become of the Republican Party if Trump loses and exits the presidency? We've seen a lot of changes in this party since the past four years. I mean, traditionally, Republicans were for free trade and Trump is for trade wars and tariffs. Traditionally, Republicans were really conservative about spending the government's money and hated debt. Trump, a debt has pretty much disappeared as a concern. I mean, traditionally, Republicans wanted strong international alliances and Trump has dumped a lot of US allies and is very for America first. So Dr. Mock, do you think that the Republican party will remain the party of Trumpism if he loses or will they return to more traditional ideas? Um, I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, I think that um, both parties, we will, I think we will expect to see in both parties some major partisan realignment regardless of what happens in the next few days. The Republican Party It is more obvious that um, as the party effect in which very prominent Republicans have denounced the party of Trump, we've seen uh, the never Trump movement. Um, we've also seen um, noted Republican intellectuals, economists, um, national security officials sign open letters. Um, denouncing uh, various elements of the Trump uh, platform and policy. Um, but what was quite telling to me is that the Republican convention just a few months ago chose for the first time in American history not to adopt a platform. Um, it, is, it is simply unprecedented. The entire purpose of the national convention is for the party to come together and to say, this is what we believe, this is what we stand for, and this is what we intend to pursue across the next four years. The Democrats have always done it. The Republicans have always done it. This is the first time the Republicans didn't do it. The reasons for it, the obvious reason, is that nobody wanted to hash that out in which Don, after which Donald Trump might disavow the platform of his own party. Um, the Maybe the less obvious reason for it is the Republicans right now are, as you noted, pursuing a variety of different policies um, and are um, really, not, uh, really not synchronizing their message. Um, so what will become of the Republican Party, I think, remains to be seen. After the 2012 loss um, of Mitt Romney to Barack Obama, um, the Republicans released what has been called the 2012 autopsy. Um, it uh, officially was called the Growth and Opportunity Project, and uh, it was a study of the party and why it lost to Barack Obama in 2012. And much of the um, much of what was um, written down in that Growth and Opportunity Project report was exactly the opposite of what Trump pursued in 2016. The idea that the party should um, specifically uh, court and uh, seek out a broader electorate, should reach out in, uh, in specifically to Latino voters, um, that the party should try to become more diverse, that the party should perhaps aim to be more centrist. Um, so I think we will see a schism uh, in the Republican Party that will have to be sorted out in the, uh, in the years to come. 
definitely. Ariel, what do you think would happen to the Republican Party? Do you think they would revert to some of the more traditional ways or continue to be divided as they have been these past four years? I think the divisions would continue and would probably increase. I mean, in the absence of Donald Trump as a sort of polarizing figure around which Republicans either kind of congregate or, you know, align on the opposing side, um, there's really not that one, that one figure that divides the entire party on either side of him. So I think that there will still be a legacy of people who agree with him and his policies and want to see those continued through future Republican elected officials and people who you know, despise Trump and his policies and want to see the Republican party steer very far away from that. And I can see a possibility of quite a few smaller sort of subgroups within the Republican party that all have their own ideas about where the party should go from here now that Trump may be leaving the scene or in four years when he inevitably does. Professor Eljabahi, do you have anything to add to that? Okay, so um, we know that the Democrats didn't score the knockout blowout that they had been hoping for in this election. A lot of them thought that it was going to be a total landslide and we would just knock Trump out of the water. Um, they didn't flip the Senate, and it's almost certain that the Republicans are going to maintain control of the Senate for these next four years. The Democratic majority in the House will in all likelihood shrink somewhat. So Dr. Mock, what does this mean in terms of getting things done? Um, I, I think it remains to be seen. I, I mean, I, on the one hand, we can take certainly um, former Vice President Biden at his word uh, of yesterday in which he said, um, if he becomes president, he will not be the president of this state or that state, this party or that party. He will be the president of all Americans, whether they voted for him or not. Um, so we would take that as, I think, an important gesture that um, a Biden administration would seek bipartisan cooperation. The problem, though, is that um, our politics in this country have, uh, have de-incentivized um, uh, um, bipartisanship and have de-incentivized cooperation. Um, Barack Obama, I believe in his last State of the Union address, said we've reached a point in American politics in which we, in which we mistake refusal to compromise for conviction. Um, I believe, um, both as a citizen and as a, as a historian, that our country and our government deserves a, uh, a loyal opposition. Um, that everything that our government does needs a check and a balance, that we need to, as James Madison said, set power against power. And um, what we have done, in, uh, particularly in Congress, is uh, create a structure in which, um, uh, in which it's difficult for members of Congress to do that. So I'm afraid that if we do have um, a divided Congress, presumably a Democratic House, a Republican Senate, and uh, in either a Republican or Democratic White House, um, that we won't see some of the, uh, uh, some of the um, major pieces of, of legislation that uh, either candidate has, has promised. I believe Donald Trump is, is now in his fourth year of saying that there's a healthcare overhaul two weeks away. Mm -hmm. Don't think we would see that. Um, likewise, the Biden the potential Biden administration has made a great deal of, of uh, um, promises, and it, it will be difficult um, to pursue those. Professor Eljabahi, if Biden does win and has to work with a primarily Republican Senate, how do you think that that's going to work? Do you think he will get any of his policies even passed? On the upside, and he served with them. And so he has long-term friendships and relationships with a lot of them. And I, you know, I think a lot of them respect him. And, but on the other hand, of course, uh, when you've got that dichotomy in power, um, symbolically even, there may be resistance. Um, even if people may want to agree and, and, and help him out, they may feel like for the constituency and for their future election that they might have to show resistance to the policies. Uh, so I think it is going, he, there's going to be um, problems there. Um, the, the thing that we're going to see 
where we see difference if Biden get a, gets elected, of course, is all the cabinet positions and all the civil servants, um, the return perhaps to normalcy in career um, civil service uh, people um, who can maybe uh, rely on um, sort of how it used to be where they could just do their job without too much political interference. And so um, you're going to see, I, I would expect, a, a large amount of um, people maybe returning to civil service positions um, and more posts that are no longer acting or interim. We're going to maybe see more permanent posts, um, perhaps less transitions and more consistency in these departments, which will help to have less turnover. Um, now, in terms of large policy, that's where it's going to be hard in the Senate. Um, but I think there are um, other things that he can get done in other areas. Absolutely. And Ariel, what do you think the likelihood is that he would be able to get across any of his larger policies? I think it really depends on the policy, honestly. Um, some might be able to receive some support from enough of the opposition to pass, and some might not. So it really depends on the situation. But I mean, the more divided the government is, obviously, the more difficult it will be to pass any major legislation. Right. And Professor Elder Bahi brought up an interesting point that I would like to touch on. So Biden was a longtime senator before he was vice president. He loves the Senate and has personal relationships with a lot of senators, including Republican leader Mitch McConnell. So I heard some pundits on NBC this morning saying that Biden and McConnell might be able to work out deals and compromises if Biden ends up winning. Dr. Mock, how do you feel about this statement? I, I agree with Professor al -Drabagi. I think that there's, um, I think Joe Biden is, is somebody who earned his stripes in the Senate. Um, I think um, we have to be careful not to create a false sense of equivalence between a Trump administration, what we've seen the past four years and a potential Biden administration, the Trump administration didn't actually pursue very many um, major pieces of legislation. Donald Trump uh, frequently had, uh, I, I guess we could call them ceremonies in which he held up executive orders or executive actions, but that's sort of the legislative equivalent of, of throwing a, a, I don't know, a, throwing a party when you balance your checkbook. Um, it doesn't actually have uh, it doesn't not actually have the um, the staying power. So I tend to agree that um, with Professor Al Jarbagi that uh, Joe Biden, having worked in the uh, worked in Congress and um, worked in the Senate, um, I think that he's uh, a much more efficient, effective operator. And of course, we have to remember that. Um, uh, Kamala Harris, vice presidential uh, candidate, also is a senator um, and would um, uh, often, uh, well, or, or I should say in the past, uh, maybe three presidential administrations, um, managing Congress, managing relationships on the Hill has fallen pretty heavily to the vice president. My assumption would be that in a Biden administration, Kamala Harris would uh, in large part play that role. Absolutely. Ariel, do you think that a Biden administration would get more done and would be more productive than the Trump administration has been? That's a very good question. Um, I think it's possible, um, but by no means certain. Honestly, I wish I had a good answer to this question, but I really don't know. No, I understand. Professor al -Jabahi, do you think that there is more likelihood that we will see more changes in policies and more laws being passed under Biden than we did in, Trump, in Trump's administration? Oh, well, Trump did attempt to do quite a few things when he first started. A weekend, he did the travel ban. He might say that's an accomplishment that he had. And then six months later, he withdrew from the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, and then he you know, appropriated or reappropriated money to go towards a, a wall um, and uh, you know mul multiple other sort of initiatives that I think he would view as a success on his side and policy initiatives and of course the tax legislation uh, the tax, corporate tax cut um, so I think we're going to see kind of the opposite policies I think within I think Biden said on day one that he was going to re-enter the um, Paris Climate Accord um, but you know, I was thinking about this. Uh, treaties have to be approved by two thirds of the Senate. So um, you know, there's an issue there. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot of um, climate 
legislation uh, attempts or um, you know clean energy infrastructure that has to do with um, clean energy initiatives. Uh, we're going to probably see more um, focus on uh, you know low income um, equality, trying to you know equalize the wage gap um, that we haven't seen, and and maybe a more I can say compassionate tone regarding immigration. Absolutely. Dr. Mock, what do you think some of the main changes we would see and notice in our day-to-day -day life would be if Biden ended up taking the win for this election? Um, I, I um, agree with Professor El Jabagi. I, I think that the Biden, a Biden administration would have uh, a more ambitious legislative agenda. Um, I um, believe we could probably take the campaign at their word that they would uh, aggressively pursue um, uh, legislation to uh, manage and to confront climate change. Um, I think, um, pr actually, I should probably say first um, to um, uh, confront the COVID crisis. Um, I think some things, as you say, in our daily life, I, I do think that the Biden administration um, would pursue uh, a federal um, minimum wage uh, increase. Um, I think that um, the uh, a Biden administration would um, try, although I do, I am skeptical that it would have a lot of success, but I believe they would try um, to uh, pursue um, a tax overhaul, um, particularly dealing with, uh, particularly dealing with the um, um, ta uh, on taxes for those making um, uh, more than four hundred thousand um, dollars. So I, I think that um, I do think that we would see some some large pieces of, of uh, legislation that the Biden administration would would be interested in pursuing. Simply a question of how effectively they could advance something like that through Congress. And Ariel, from a perspective of a college student, how do you think that your life might be changed if Biden does end up winning this presidency? Honestly, that's a that's a very good question, depending on what policies he and his administration would enact first. Um, I believe we know that their first actions as an administration would most likely be to re-enter the Paris Climate Accords and try to um, move our country towards cleaner energy and confronting climate change, um, which would really affect everyone's life. Um, what I'm curious about as a college student is um, whether any sort of student loan debt forgiveness would be some policy that the Biden administration would pursue. I honestly have not looked into whether that is one of Biden's policies um, or whether something like that could be a result of a Biden administration. Right. Professor Elderbahi, if Trump does end up losing this election, what do you think he will do next? Uh, I think he craves the public eye, that he will not let go of the spotlight if he can help it. And um, so I think he'll definitely I don't know, maybe create is, I think they've tried to kind of create their own uh, television network, um, perhaps even a, you know, a super PAC, um, sort of a tea party spinoff, like the Trump, you know, spinoff. And I think you will just continue to try to um, be in the public eye and get as many uh, tweet follow or Twitter followers as they can. Absolutely. Dr. Mock, what do you think will be next for President Trump if he doesn't win? I don't know. I, I don't necessarily know that I could could hazard a guess. Um, I um, honestly don't know that if we could ask uh, Donald Trump himself if, if he knows. Um, he okay. certainly is in a great deal of legal jeopardy. Um, per, uh, he is, his organization is, his children are. Um, I don't know um, quite how, uh, how he would confront that. Um, he has made various jokes, of course, that we'll never see him again. He said that a couple of days ago. He said that he may leave the United States. I, I, I find that hard to believe. I mean, maybe he, you know, maybe he was just trying to be funny or cheeky or something. But um, I, uh, I, I really um, don't know. Let's see, Ariel, if the results come out and it does happen to be that Biden wins, how do you think Trump will react? I think his first response will probably be to cast doubt on the legitimacy of the election. 
which in some places we already see him doing, demanding that votes not be counted in some states and continue to be counted in others. I think it's likely that if Biden does win the election, Trump's first reaction will be to claim that it's fake news and the election was maybe rigged against him. And do you think that if he does end up claiming this, how long do you think he would continue to pursue these claims until he's proven otherwise? Well, I honestly don't know. I don't think he could pursue them for that long because if Biden does you know, win the election fair and square, then it shouldn't be too difficult to demonstrate that. And once, you know, once that's been proved, there's really nothing else Trump can do about that other than tweet about it. I may disagree though with Ariel, um, not, not, not in principle, but, but simply in practice. I, I would think he would disagree as long as the cameras are rolling. Um, as, long as, as long as folks are willing to listen, um, I would tend to think that he would say some version of what Ariel just said. Well, that's fake news, or it was stolen from us, or it was illegitimate in the following states, or, or whatever the case may be. Because in 2016, he won, and he cast doubt on the legitimacy of the election. He claimed that there were millions of votes cast illegally, despite the fact that there was no evidence of such a thing happening. And I, I should add, that is fundamentally unprecedented in American history. We have had some very bitter elections. The election of 1800, the election of 1860, the election of, 18, uh, uh, of 1876, some very bitter elections. But to have a presidential candidate or the president himself um, to say that the election is illegitimate, votes should not be counted, um, there are, uh, you know, there are um, irregularities. You can't trust what you see. That hasn't happened uh, before in in our politics. Um, and I, I'm, you know, I'm, I want to caution anybody again against creating a sense of false equivalence, wherein, um, you know, we're looking at say Biden on the one hand and Trump on the other. This is unprecedented. Absolutely. I. You know, after elections, after presidential elections, historically, President Bush went and started painting and Obama went kite surfing. Uh, Trump will not do any of those things. He will pack stadiums if he can and continue to talk about locking up Clinton and things that happened four years ago, six years ago, eight years ago. He doesn't forget or, or if he has a, a line that gets the crowd going, he's going to repeat it over and over again. So he will not go quietly into the sunset. I think he will continue to ride his wave as long as that wave will, uh, will take him. Absolutely. Dr. Mock, do you think there is a real danger that Trump might refuse to leave office in January of 2021? Uh, Professor Aldrabach is laughing because she's glad you didn't ask her that question. Uh, <laughs> You're next. <laughs> I, um, I, I honestly um, don't know. I mean, I, I, do, I do think that we have seen uh, some stalwarts of the Republican Party um, say and tweet and, and um, you know, give comment in the past few days um, that it is uh, the responsibility of everybody to accept the results of the election after all of the votes have been counted. Um, Marco Rubio um, said as much, Senator from Florida, uh, um, uh, Scott Walker, governor, former governor of Wisconsin, um, said, the, said something quite similar. Um, there's, there's not really a, a, a legal mechanism that I know of for that, aside from the fact that the Constitution says that uh, the House of Representatives will, uh, will take action and certify the election. Um, so, um, you know, at some point, regardless of, of um, how tense these days feel, um, the election will be over. The votes will have been counted. Secretaries of state in each of the individual states will have certified the vote. Um, and uh, the, the um, you know, it, it, Donald Trump would sort of look like a, um, an addled old man shouting at the wind um, if he refused to, uh, to leave office.
Yeah, I completely agree with you on that one. Ariel, do you have anything to add to that? Not really. I mean, I find it very hard to believe that Trump would actually refuse to leave office. I'm sure that if Biden wins, he will tweet about it and talk about it on TV and, you know, act like the election was stolen from him and talk about it being illegitimate. But I don't think that all of his rhetoric would prevent him from actually stepping down when it's time. I mean, and to put it another way, the, I, I agree, um, Ariel, I think though that the office will leave him whether he chooses to leave the office or not. Um, he will no longer be president uh, if, he, if he does not win in the next few days, he will no longer be president on January 20th at noon. Professor Elger Bahi, do you think that there is anything like, do you, how long do you think that he would continue to fight these results if he didn't win? I mean, he will continue to spin, spin, spin and uh, litigate uh, until the courts run their process. And thankfully, uh, we still have enough of our democracy left, enough of our government systems in place and uh, enough reasonable, competent people at the helm of states and election authorities that uh, our system is designed to deal with even people who uh, may continue to sort of, um, you know, prolong the inevitable. So um, I, I think he will, you know, maybe to his dying days, continue to be talking about this um, and tweeting about it. Um, but like Dr. Mock said that uh, he may not want to leave, but the office will leave him. Ariel and Dr. Mox, do you have anything else you would like to add on this? No, I don't. Okay, well, wonderful. Well, that is all the time we have for today. Thank you all so much for meeting with me. I really appreciate us having this discussion. I think this was a great time to get to talk because we're right in the midst of everything. I know we will all be tirelessly checking our phones and computers um, until whenever in the next couple of days or weeks, the results do come out. Um, but I wish all of you the best of luck. Stay calm. I know it's going to be fair either way. But thank you for meeting with me. I'm C. Hearn for GC360.